So many physicians give a label of IBS to any chronic uh, intestinal problem once they have ruled out uh, other disease. So if the patient comes with gas, pain abdomen, everything, anything like that, they say that it's just IBS. But this is not IBS. In fact, there's a big lot of uh, inter GI disorders which are known as functional GI disorders and IBS is a subset of uh, uh, disorder uh, among the functional GI disorders. So mo many patients will come with either heartburn, nausea, vomiting, bloating, gas, pain abdomen, constipation, diarrhea. And there are many organic causes for these, including cancer, infection, tuberculosis, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, peptic ulcer. But once you have ruled out all this and there are no structural abnormalities, then you would label them as functional cause of uh, these symptoms. And then this is called as functional GI disorders. And uh, lately in last uh, couple, uh, last one or two decades, uh, Rome Foundation was created, which constitutes members from about 27 countries. They are 144 experts, and they have devised various criteria to diagnose these functional GI disorders. So functional GI disorders are now uh, based on these Rome diagnostic criteria. And the Rome criteria actually lists the functional uh, disorders of various organs of GI tract, like there could be a disorder of the esophagus, then gastroduodenal disorders, bowel disorders, then CNS disorders, gallbladder and sphincter of odi disorders, and anorectal disorders, and the, uh, the diseases uh, which represent these disorders, like functional chest pain, functional dyspepsia is the fun gastroduodenal disorder, then uh, IBS is the representative disorder of functional bowel disease, and similarly there are other diseases as well. But they are not only IBS and functional dyspepsia, there are a host of other diseases which are labeled as functional gastrointestinal disorders. So how common are functional uh, gastrointestinal disorders? In India, the most frequent symptoms of functional disorder is gas. Anytime the patients in any clinic, even be it cardiology clinic or a diabetic clinic, most patients will, in addition to complaining of their uh, symptoms, they'll also say that they are having gas and uh, they want to get rid of the gas. So if we see all the disorders starting from esophagus to gastroduodenal disorders, IBS, bowel disorders, many of these uh, disorders have gas as one of the important symptoms. So uh, a global study was conducted uh, where worldwide prevalence of functional GI disorders was conducted. And uh, uh, Dr. Ghoshal and Dr. Nitesh Prasta represented India. And it was found that uh, at least 40, 20 to 40 percent of uh, population do suffer from some of the other functional GI disorders. And these GI disorders could range from dyspepsia, constipation, IBS, diarrhea, or even just bloating, abdominal bloating, and any other. And But most for, uh, common was uh, constipation, as Dr. Rajesh Rupadhyaya did mention. Up to 11 to 12 percent had constipation. And also, um, the IBS was uh, in around 4 percent. Dyspepsia, or the upper abdominal discomfort, was around 7 percent. In India, a good uh, large study was done on prevalence of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and it was found that at least four to seven percent of population do have irritable bowel syndrome. So what is the pathogenesis of functional GI disorders? Uh, right from the 1950s onwards, people have been trying to discern the pathogenesis of functional GI disorders. And initially it was thought that functional GI disorders are only due to stress and uh, due to, it's uh, due to brain. But later, other uh, um, pathogenetic disorders came into focus, like meal was considered uh, one of the uh, causes. Then visceral hypersensitivity uh, came. And in last few uh, years, it is uh, being thought as, as the f it is a gut-brain axis disorder. So what is gut-brain axis? So in a person who is predisposed in early life, uh, early childhood by abuse or parental beliefs or behaviors or social learning and uh, they have, if they have genetic disorders, then later in the adulthood, because of uh, very psychological factors, uh, they may have, may develop a disorder known as gut-brain 
disorder. So they develop visceral hypersensitivity, and in the intestinal, they may have a certain low-grade uh, immune-mediated uh, inflammation, and also there's a alteration in the gut uh, mucosa, and there's alteration in the gut microbiome. So all these uh, disorders in the gut, which leads to uh, action back on the brain, is uh, defined as gut-brain disorders. So there is a stress or anxiety on the CNS level, and then there's low-grade inflammation in the GIT level, and that can cause the, these disorders. So brain-gut axis is very important, and because the brain uh, also, there's inhibitory pathway in the spinal canal, and then uh, pain is perceived by the brain. So when there is visceral hypersensitivity in the intestine, it is perceived as severe pain by the brain. So about functional uh, gastrointestinal disorder, we, they are very common, up, and up to 40% of the general population are affected by it. And functional gastrointestinal disorders constitute functional constipation, up to 12%, dyspepsia, 7%, diarrhea, 5%, IBS, 7%, and unspecified, 11%. The pathogenesis are multifactorial, especially there is a role of brain-gut axis, abnormal motility, visceral hypersensitivity, psychological factors, then there's role of gut microbiome, gut inflammation, and increased permeability, bile acids, and CNS processing and gait control theory. Now coming to the IBS. So IBS is basically play, pain plus altered by bowel habit. So I, in the diagnosis of IBS, the pain is an essential criteria. And usually the patients of IBS will have symptoms of more than six months, and following criteria should be fulfilled uh, within last three months that there should be recurrent abdominal pain and the pain should uh, occur almost every week. And uh, along with the pain, at least two of the following should be there. Either the pain is related to defecation or there is a change in frequency of the stool so th they may get diarrhea or they may get constipation uh, along with the pain or there's a change in form of the pain, uh, stool. So th they would get either loose stools or they may get lumpy or hard stools. So if there's no pain, then we cannot label as IBS. So for IBS, the pain is the most important symptom. If there's no pain, then we can definitely say that he may be having functional GI disorders, but it is not IBS. So this is a WhatsApp chat which uh, we doctors often receive early in the morning. Doctor, I need help. So when the doctor says, what happened to you? Then he says, I'm having very severe constipation, doctor, in, in, the, in the morning. Then uh, when the doctor asks, how many times are you passing stool? Then the patient replies, I'm passing three to four times uh, a day. When the doctor asks if you're passing stool three to four times a day, then why do you say that you are having constipation? Then, and the last he says, pet ne safora. That means he's having incomplete evacuation. This is a very common disorder where, as Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay also mentioned, that the patient's perception of constipation is different from the doctor's definition of constipation. The doctors define constipation according to uh, the well-laid criteria while the patient, even if he's passing stool three to four times a day, but if he's not feeling satisfied uh, by passing stool, he'll still say it is, uh, he's having constipation. So to diagnose constipation, a Bristol stool uh, scale is very important, which Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay also mentioned. So the type 1 and type 2, where they are a very separate lump-like stools or sausage-shaped stool, this uh, constitute constipation. Type 3, type 4, and type 5 are normal stool. Type 6, where there's fluffy pieces of uh, stool, and type 7, where there's watery and no uh, solid pieces, these are constitute diarrhea. So we, all the doctors, all the physicians, you all must have a Bristol stool, stool uh, chart in your clinic so that once the patient says, I'm having constipation, you can show this is a stool chart and ask him what type of stool he's passing. So based on a Bristol uh, stool chart, the IBS is divided into either constipation predominant when he's ty passing type one or type two stool, or it is diarrhea predominant IBS when he is uh, passing a six, type 6 or type 7 stool, and sometimes he is having mixed type. Sometimes the patient is passing uh, constipation type, type 1 or 2, and sometimes type 6. And then there's an unspecified type. 
So what is the clinical profile of our irritable bowel syndrome? This was a large study which was done, uh, published few years ago with Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay was also a part of this study. And uh, the uh, IBS patients were divided into three types, constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant, and indeterminate based on the stool frequency. And it was found that uh, incomplete evaluation or the, when the patient says, pet nahi saaf ho raha, and he's not able to clear his stools is common in all three types, even in constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant, indeterminant predominant, at least 80 to 90% of the patients complain of incomplete evacuation. Then the other common symptoms is mucus. The patient says that he's passing a lot of mucus. And then the, even the patient is having uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, which is a disorder of lower GI tract, he still have, may have, at least in 50% of patients, have upper abdominal discomfort. Then these patients, at least 70, 80% have tiredness as their symptoms. So IBS leads to a lo loss of work uh, and lots of tiredness, inability to, and it can lead to depression as well. So how do we approach to a patient with, uh, patient with suspected IBS? Uh, so once you've diagnosed the IBS, the according to based on the criteria of Rome uh, 4 criteria, that there is pain, there's alteration in bowel habit, and then pain is related to defecation, then you have to rule out alarm features. Doc, Dr. Upadhyay already mentioned these alarm features, like if there is weight loss, if there's blood in stool, if the onset of uh, uh, symptoms is uh, may more than 50 years, if there's fever, any family history of colorectal can cancer, and if there's lymphadenopathy or if there's anemia, these are alarm features. If they have, we have ruled out, if the alarm features are present, then we have to investigate further because these patients may have certain serious disorders like GI malignancy. But if they are not there, then very limited uh, laboratory tests are required like complete blood count, C-reactive protein, fecal calprotectin, and just celiac disease serology. Only these four tests are important, and then we can diagnose IBS. And once you have diagnosed IBS, you have to classify it uh, either constipation predominant, or diarrhea predominant, or the mixed variety, based on the Bristol stool uh, chart. So uh, I mentioned about a test called fecal calprotectin. So what is fecal calprotectin? So stool calprotectin uh, is a calcium and zinc uh, binding protein, uh, and it is mainly found in neutrophils and it is found throughout the body. But if the calprotectin is being excreted in feces, it means there is increased neutrophil migration into the GI tract and which indicates there's inflammation. So when stool calprotectin is high, then it indicates inflammatory bowel disease and this is not IBS. So fecal calprotectin is normal, then it is IBS probably. But if it is elevated, then we have to suspect irritable uh, inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. So how do we treat IBS? So once uh, you have diagnosed IBS, then establish a good doctor-patient relationship because it's a lifelong disease. So we have to acknowledge that it is a disease and the patient is not a psychiatric patient. He's not mental or like that. And we have to reassure the patient. We have to educate the patient. And then lifestyle modification is important. We have to increase the fiber intake. We have to decrease the FODMAP diet, increase physical activity, and avoid stress. And according to the classification, IBSC, uh, that constipation predominant, you have to give for pain. In all three categories, you have to give antispasmodics. But uh, in the IBSC, you have to give osmotic laxative, as Dr. Padhya mentioned. For diarrhea predominant, we have to give loperamide. But if it is, it is not effective in, uh, in the first stage, then you can uh, give, uh, give other drugs like linactoplide, rifaximin, and cholesteramine. And then you can also uh, add uh, antidepressant. For constipation pre uh, predominant, you have to add SSRIs. And for mixed type or diarrhea predominant, you have to add tricyclic antidepressant. What are low FODMAP diets? Uh, FODMAP means fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyols. And FODMAP diet leads to high osmotic load, and uh, it leads to high colonic gas production in the setting of visceral hypersensitivity. And multiple studies and uh, meta-analysis have shown that if you give low fat FODMAP diet, then the patient feels better because the less gas is produced and so there's less bloating and so patient feels better, especially those having high, high uh, visceral hypersensitivity. So they have less of abdominal discomfort. So uh, uh, you, we must have a low FODMAP diet chart 
like for example, vegetables, certain vegetables have, uh, are high FODMAP, we must avoid them like garlic, onions, while uh, lettuce and carrot are low FODMAP. Similarly, fruits, proteins, fats, they are, um, we can divide them into low FODMAP containing and high FODMAP containing, and we can uh, advise our patients. So IBS is uh, a specific form of functional GI disorders, which is characterized by pain plus altered bowel habit. Apart from pain, altered bowel, uh, many patients also have other functional symptoms, such as dyspepsia, bloating, gas, and IBS has four subtypes, constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant, undeterminate, and mixed variety. And diagnosis is basically clinical with minimal tests, and treatment, as I mentioned, is mainly symptomatic. Thank you for your patient hearing.